can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord?
Hey, Van Church family and friends, I'm glad you're here. Some of you may know this about me, but I get a little competitive when playing games. So today I thought I'd share with you a true story about one of the most epic game experiences I've ever had. On Easter in 2002, we were with Beth's parents and her grandmother, Nana, for lunch. And after lunch, we decided to play a game of spoons. If you've never played spoons, it's a little bit like musical chairs. After one person gets four of the same card, they grab a spoon. And as soon as one person has grabbed a spoon, everyone else gets to try to grab one. But there's one less spoon than the number of people playing. So the person who gets left without a spoon is out of the game. It can get really intense because everyone's frantically and aggressively grabbing for spoons all at once. Well, I was sitting next to Beth's dear, sweet Nana, and I had noticed something a little concerning, that every time it was time to grab a spoon, Nana would lunge for one in a way where she just hopped up from her seat a bit. And this had happened enough times where she had worked her way up toward the front of her chair. And these chairs had wheels on the bottom. So you can probably guess what's coming. We were playing the next round, and it came time to grab the spoons, and as everyone grabbed for a spoon, Nana once again came up out of her seat, 
only this time when she came back down, she hit the front of her chair, which toppled the chair forward, and down went Nana. Here's the problem. In the midst of all of that, Nana and I had both grabbed the same spoon. <laughs> she had one end, and I had other. I had the other. And so when Nana goes crashing to the floor and is still holding on to one end of the spoon, and I'm holding on to the other, it sure looked to everyone at the table like I knocked Nana down out of her chair to the floor just so I could win spoons. <laughs> Grandson-in-law of the year right there, right? And Beth's family has never let me live that down since. A game like spoons is exactly how our world works. You have to be fast and aggressive if you want to win. We live in a world where the people who win are those who grab life by the horns, seize the day, make sure you get your slice of the pie. In a world of aggression, self-promotion, and violence, those who win seem to be the ones who do whatever it takes. But Jesus calls us to a different kind of life, a life of gentleness, humility, and meekness. He invites us to let the Spirit cultivate this fruit of gentleness in us, which is what we're going to talk about today. And so Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Be completely gentle and humble. Let's drill down for a moment on the character of gentleness, because it's often misunderstood. There's this old Goofy cartoon made by Disney where Goofy is a nice man named Mr. Walker. He's nice to his neighbors, he's kind, he's a simple man, but when he gets behind the wheel of his car, he turns into Mr. Wheeler, an angry, aggressive jerk, trying to run over everyone who gets in his way. We, we kind of all know that we're supposed to avoid being like Mr. Wheeler. But we often sway to the opposite extreme, seen in another, in another old comic character, Casper Milktoast, who is a complete pushover, a total doormat. He lets people take advantage of him. He's afraid to speak his mind or take a stand. He wants to make sure that everyone approves of him. He's a pitiful character. It's obvious that the road rage jerk isn't a person of gentleness. But the kind of gentleness that we're called to, the kind of gentleness that Paul writes about, the kind of gentleness that Jesus shows, isn't being a pushover or a doormat. The word in the original language for gentleness, prautas, comes from the same root as the words for meek or humble. Author Timothy Keller describes this characteristic as humility or self-forgetfulness. And C.S. Lewis says something similar, that this characteristic is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often. So the opposite of this idea of gentleness or humility or meekness would be a sense of superiority or a self-absorbed self-aggrandizement. But gentleness also has a counterfeit, which is inferiority, a self-absorbed self-consciousness. The gentleness that the Spirit of Jesus wants to cultivate in us avoids both self-absorbed superiority and self-absorbed inferiority. 
Gentleness is not weakness. It's not inferiority. It's not being a doormat. Instead, gentleness and humility, meekness, is the strength of character required to ground our relationships in something other than pride and power. God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom where God's order, God's dream for the world is restored by reversing or inverting or turning on its head the order that's typically lived out by human beings. The way we do things, God has to turn all of that on its head to bring about his kingdom. The kingdoms we construct almost always exalt the rich, the powerful, the proud, and the aggressive. One posture of life is to seize life by the horns and take it. And the world seems to think that this is how you take real life into your hands, and it rewards those who do so. After all, if you don't, someone else will take that slice of the pie. So you might as well grab for it while you have a chance. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that in his kingdom, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. God will give the earth as an inheritance, the world, the whole world, as an inheritance to those who are meek. Humble and gentle. Those who can't or won't seize life, but instead trust in God to provide. That's crazy. It's upside down. This doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't seem to be the way that the world really works. I mean, really, Jesus, the meek and the gentle inherit the earth? I mean, look around. It sure doesn't look like it. Jesus assures us that it's true. The meek and humble and gentle will inherit the earth. So we have to decide, do we believe Jesus? Can he be trusted on this one? Or was he just some idealistic fool? Well, a good way to find out if Jesus can be trusted is to look at his own life and to see what plays out and whether or not it's true. And so let's look at the gentleness of Jesus. Jesus invites us to come to him. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wasn't a doormat. And he also refused to use power the way that most would in order to accomplish his mission. Jesus embodies the kind of deep inner quiet strength that made him compelling and good and truly powerful. Philip Kinnison shares the following reflection. When John, in the book of Revelation, looks for the conquering lion who can open the scroll and its seven seals, he sees instead a lamb. The lion is the lamb. And the way of the lamb is the way of the cross. Yet such surprises are not limited to the closing chapters of the Christian story. When we look for a king born of royalty, we find instead a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, manger born to a peasant girl of no account. When Jesus' time has come to begin his ministry and we look for him to put John the baptizer in his place as now second in rank, we find instead a Jesus who humbly approaches John in order to be baptized by him. When we look for Jesus to take the world by storm, to win over those who have power, influence, and prestige in order to advance his kingdom more efficiently, we find instead an itinerant preacher and healer who spends much of his time with the weak and outcasts of society, children, lepers, prostitutes, and tax collectors. When we see Jesus rejected by the Samaritans, we look for him to do what his disciples wanted done, to rain down fire upon them, 
but instead he rebukes us. When we look for the conquering hero to make his move, to enter into the royal city on his white horse to signal to the people that the time has come to establish his kingdom, we find instead a Jesus who enters into Jerusalem astride a humble donkey. And when we gather with him for the last time in that upper room, expecting to get our marching orders and to honor him by pledging our allegiance to him, we find instead that he honors us by washing our feet and by calling us his friends. When Jesus is arrested and taken before the authorities and mocked, we looked for him to set those authorities straight, to proclaim proudly and defiantly that he is God's anointed one. Instead, we find him strangely silent, showing no need to justify himself. When we look for a deliverer, who will crush the opposition by superior force, we find instead a servant Messiah who allows himself to be crushed and bruised for us. What kind of God is this? Perhaps when we find ourselves refusing to do something that Jesus did or tells us to do, and we say, Jesus, that just... It just doesn't work in the real world anymore. Perhaps in those moments, we should call to mind Jesus standing in front of an empty tomb, reminding us, my way does work. In fact, it's the only way that works. And so Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. How do we do that? what first helps to identify the kind of obstacles that tend to get in our way. And so I want to identify a few. The first obstacle we face is all the violent and aggressive narratives surrounding us. Depictions of violence occur in over 60% of all television programming. The average television viewer is exposed to roughly 18,000 violent interactions per year. By age 18, a child in our culture will have seen around 16,000 simulated murders and 200,000 acts of violence on TV. Most of these violent acts are depicted as justified and redemptive and heroic. How many of the stories that we love involve revenge or violent justice? Is it any wonder, then, that we often respond to problems and conflicts in our world and in our relationships with aggression? Beyond violence, many of our other entertainment options promote aggression as well, like sports or reality TV shows centered around competition and beating out others. When we spend so much time internalizing these messages, and we are internalizing them, why would we think that we could readily respond with gentleness and meekness and humility in all the different situations of our lives. The second obstacle we face is our culture's rewarding of aggression and self-promotion. We're encouraged from even the youngest ages to climb as high on the ladder as possible, often by whatever means necessary. I mean, this is why all of those celebrity people paid bribes to get their kids into college Not only that, but we're told that in order to make a real difference in the world, we can only do so through a position of power and influence. Unless we want to risk failure and live a life of insignificance and ineffectiveness, we're told that if we're going to make our mark on the world, we have to do so using the tactics of the world, which often involve coercion, power, and manipulation. I mean, this is seen especially in the world of politics. 
How many candidates can you identify who have gentleness, meekness, and humility as defining virtues? <laughs> and we're told that the only people who can really make a difference or shape the direction of the world are those who are elected officials, who sit at the center of the seats of power, and who know how to get things done. But scripture reminds us in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Our third obstacle comes in the form of Christians trying to protect God. We tend to set gentleness on the shelf when we are convinced that we are defending God. We may treat others harshly, convinced that we are standing up for the truth. But if God is God, then God doesn't need to be protected. He doesn't need to be defended by you. And those who would ignore gentleness in their zeal to protect and defend God and God's values in the world, those people run the risk of at least overstepping their responsibility and perhaps even run the risk of what they're protecting, not even being God at all, but an idol. Each of these obstacles as well as many others we could mention, would try to root out the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts. But God is faithful, and he will bring to completion the work that he begins in us. That's good news. And we get to participate, although it's often challenging. Here are a few practices we can embrace as God helps us grow in gentleness. The first is learning to yield. It's not a matter of if we will have conflict with each other, but when and how we'll engage each other in our conflict. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Listen, we will disagree about things that matter. And learning to yield does not mean that we can't have deeply held convictions, nor does it mean that we just assume that all viewpoints are equally valid. But we should not always assume up front that we are in the right and those who think differently than us are in the wrong. We need to listen carefully to each other. We can yield by entertaining the possibility that we might be wrong. And even if we aren't wrong, yielding opens up the possibility of understanding another person better. When we stop to listen and understand, we may find that those who we once regarded as opponents can indeed become friends. Our second practice is kneeling in prayer. Jesus instructed us to pray for our enemies, not because it will transform them, but because it transforms us. Praying for others, especially our opponents, tends to soften our hearts towards them and encourages us to respond to them in gentleness as other broken people made in the image of God. Prayer also reminds us that we, uh, we approach God in humility, which is why a traditional posture of prayer is kneeling. Not because it helps God hear our prayers, but because it helps remind us who we are when we come before God. Becoming aware of our own shortcomings and sin also allows us to treat others with gentleness. On October 2nd, 2006, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Charles Roberts, a milk truck driver, 
took a gun into the nickel mines Amish schoolhouse. He took the girls and the teacher there hostage and ended up shooting 10 little girls, five of whom died, before he ended up shooting himself. The world was shocked. The community was shocked. The Amish community was deeply shocked and in grief. As shocking as this was, perhaps even more shocking was the response from the families and the rest of the Amish community. The Amish are committed to the notion of nonviolence, and they're also committed to forgiveness and reconciliation. The community not only forgave Charles Roberts for what he had done that day, but also that very same day, they went to his family's house to comfort them in the grief, their grief, over the loss of their son. How? How could they possibly do that? Because they had learned from Jesus, who while on the cross said of those killing him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Gentleness, meekness, humility, forgiveness. These are not weaknesses, but instead, they are extraordinary power. Anyone can live a life of aggression, grabbing life by the horns in every way possible. That is not true strength, although it looks like it, and it's not real life. But it takes a person living out the fruit, cultivated by the Spirit of Christ, to have the quiet strength and confidence that God will make things right in the end. That Jesus is true to his word when he said, Blessed are the meek, the humble, the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And if you're like me, I say, God, I, I just have so far to go. I know I should believe you, but many days I just struggle to believe that that's true. I need you to cultivate the fruit of gentleness, the fruit of your spirit in me. If you're like me, I need to lay my heart before God today in humility and repentance for the many, many ways in which I have refused to be humble and gentle, meek and forgiving and kind. Or perhaps you've been living a life of counterfeit gentleness by being disempowered and letting other people take advantage of you. And if that's the case, may you be empowered to live out a life of quiet but strong confidence that God is by your side. May we all follow the example of Jesus, the one who showed us in his death and in his resurrection that love wins, that the meek those who won't take over the world through power, they are indeed the ones who will inherit the earth. And as we listen to his words once again, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today, may the Spirit of God fill your heart and your mind. May it renew you from the inside out. And may it begin to cultivate in you this, this characteristic of gentleness. May it bloom and may those around you see that God is good.
the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your head, lay back against you and breathe, and feel your heart. It's more than I can stand I melt in your peace It's so Stand. 